Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. Hello guys and welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, a weekly show about all things Port Adelaide Footy Club. I'm your host, Mac 19 and joining me as always, as co-host, we got Fishing Rick. How are you, buddy? Oh, man, I feel like it's just grand, Groundhog Day today. It does. I feel like I'm just having the same conversations over and over again. I'm I've got a sense fantastic. of deja vu here, mate. It is. I'm bloody fantastic. Very excited. Our footy club's in the finals and, you know, we've all been uh, complaining or some of us have been complaining it's not high enough, but... You know, we still finished fifth on the ladder and uh, it's exciting times and I'm looking forward to our first home final at Adelaide Oval. That's it. We're in there. It's up to us to make history. Absolutely. And we've got a special guest on this evening uh, by the lovely Portia. Hello. How are we all? Very good. Very good. Excellent. Now, who's going? First things first, before we get into the love-hate, who will be attending the match uh, this weekend? Not me. Not you. No, 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 I have fans that, uh, friends that are not fans of football, so I get sucked into things that aren't football, unfortunately. Very badly scheduled. Oh, you need some better friends, I well, think. Very true. Very oh, true. just get rid of all your friends and just go to the football. I mean, I could try that, but then you have seasons like 2011, and then you just think, well, I have nothing in my life. <laughs> 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 uh. This is very true. Just, very true. just make friends with the poor players on Facebook and then everything's right again. Uh, fair enough, but I probably say too many nasty things at times. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? That's well, I'll try to be there, Macca. I'm just uh, trying to see if I can get the right tickets. That's all. Now, you only have corporate tickets, don't you? So you might not do. be able to get in. Which, which technically means I'm not a member. So mm. I've got to try and uh, hunt around and see what corporate ticket suit and uh, and then go from there or the SACA members also get access to tickets as well so okay. uh, well, I'll play it by ear and uh, I'll see uh, see what comes of it but I mean the SACA ones aren't too bad actually 175 bucks a ticket and um, I think you're in the the committee room on the okay. western on the western stand and yep. I think you get um, Cocktail food served for one hour pre-match and at half time, and beverages from start to finish. So I could be sloshed. That's the way. Well, it did seem yesterday that I was not going to be able to go um, due to family uh, family things on Father's Day. But we've done a little bit of rejigging, um, and I got myself a ticket. I might not be able to see the whole game, but I will be there for most of the game. That's right. Better than nothing. Who's going Better to go? Better than nothing. Absolutely. Uh, just just me going? at this point. Just me. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's all that matters. Well, that's it. Such is life. It does. Such is life. Benny Cousins. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's get into our love and hate, uh, which is one thing we loved, one thing we hated about Port Adelaide this week. Rick, I think you've got a bit of an interesting one. I do. I've got a bit of a bipolar love and hate, Macca. I, I hate that the AFL is so biased at times and finishing fifth on the ladder and having a home final, we're not even entitled to wear our proper Guernsey and, and they're making us way, wear our away Guernsey. I mean, I just think it's ridiculous and it, and it just shows the, the VFL mentality still uh, lives with the bias that they've got in the AFL system. And uh, I'll bookend it with my love, which is, isn't it fantastic that we might be able to wear our prison bars for the uh, for the home final, just to to make it even sweeter. It's just beautiful this, <laughs> and is, ironic. Is this one of the most bizarre things you've seen in AFL world so far? I mean, you win a home final, you're banned from wearing your home Guernsey to your home final. Uh, the away team is allowed to wear their home Guernsey because apparently they don't have an appropriate Clash Guernsey, despite the fact that they've worn the Clash Guernsey probably you know 15 to 20 times in the last four years. But apparently there's now some super dress code for finals, which no one ever knew about. But we're allowed to wear our prison bar Guernsey, which were normally banned completely from even coming to the conclusion that we'd want to wear it, let alone putting it together. I mean, it's just bizarre. It is bizarre. What sort of tin pot league is this? 
Uh, it's a really good question. I think that uh, in part it's probably just that Gillan McLaughlin can't replace himself. That would be, could be part of it. These things happen. I don't know. Or is it because Gillan McLaughlin is actually trying to impart himself into onto the league? Maybe he's open-minded to the prison bar Guernsey. Maybe it's a, a way of saying sorry to Port because he's not going to help us out with the SMA negotiations. Mm. Right. It just seems strange. I mean, if if Richmond, they've got a clash Guernsey, which they've worn against us in the past. They've worn it this year. Um, if it's appropriate for the minor round, why would it not be appropriate for the for the finals? Look, that's a really good mm. question. But I guess my other question would be is why does Richmond have a clash Guernsey that's not just, you know, 80% yellow with a black sash or something? And there'd be absolutely mm. no problem at all. Well, it's very true. I mean, you, it's probably the only league in the world i mean every other league from every other sport in the world you know the clubs have two three sometimes even four guernseys that they wear throughout the year yeah to account for all sorts of different clashes yeah it's just i mean they they even made frio in their uh, home and away game not long ago against richmond where they're away in guernsey in their at their home game as well didn't they well, uh, Frio had to wear their away Guernsey for the grand final last year, despite the fact that there was pretty much no clash at all with Hawthorne. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, but with the ho- oh, I don't know. Did they flip the coin? Because isn't there something with the grand final where they flip a coin and one team gets to pick the change rooms, the other one wears their home Guernsey or something like that? Or I seem to remember that being the case back when Port were playing in the grand final. Don't know. I'm not too sure. Don't get logic in the I way mean, of it. It's just silly. Really, I mean, <laughs> they came up with this idea that everyone had to have a predominantly white Clash Guernsey um, yes. about five or six years ago, but only half the teams decided to actually do it. Everyone else complained about it. So the likes of Essendon and Richmond uh, get let off the hook. I mean, it's just well, not good enough. Well, just on the, while we're on the topic, can I just make a, a slightly controversial statement? Um, I actually think that our regular Guernsey is better than the prison bar now. Oh, I would be more than happy for us to wear our home Guernsey. I just want us to wear our home Guernsey to our home font. Yep. Mm. Yep. No, I don't know. I love, I've still got an emotional attachment to the eighties and nineties. So I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be wearing the prison bars. To me, that's Port Adelaide. Yep. That's fair enough. So, so, um, Do we think that all... this is maybe some sort of thing where because the AFL relented on us being able to do the whole never tear us apart thing before the game, they've sort of had a bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to Richmond saying, well, you can wear your home Guernsey, Port can wear their away Guernsey. Oh, yeah, I don't know. That'd be <laughs> Look, honestly, I hope that's not the case because that would have my estimation of the AFL even lower than they already are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mm. it's, and it's interesting that the the uh, Collingwood uh, Football Club has got no opinion, negative opinion on this. Oh, they've approved it. So, yeah. long as, so long as we wear the white shorts and can get the Guernseys made up in time, we can wear the prison bars, apparently. Why does it matter if we're wearing white shorts and not black shorts? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's Honestly, just bizarre. what I does mean, that every, really everyone, matter? I made a quip in the podcast last week that you know, Gillen must have been trying to smoke his tweed jacket. I think everyone's smoking his tweed jacket at AFL House at the moment. I mean, it's just mm. ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, maybe we're not allowed to wear um, um, black and white underwear either. You know, it has to be uh, some sort of other colour. It's just it's just a farce. But anyway, at least there's a happy ending. There's another prison bar, Guernsey. And maybe uh, there won't be an SMA negotiation in our favour. So maybe we have to rely on trying to sell five millions of uh, PBs and BIBs every year to try and make, the, make up the shortfall. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe that adds to our general revenue. And so, therefore, they give us a worse SMA deal saying, look at all this money you made from merchandise. Oh. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, Sergeant Schultz has got a um, a good point on the forum. I'm just scrolling through while we're having a chat because I missed it today. Um, how come we weren't allowed to wear it against Carlton in the, in the second last round? Mm. Well, I mean, at, at that time, Eddie McGuire was saying two two weeks ago that it was it's locked away forever. Port Adelaide will never wear it again. Mm. So very very odd. But oh. anyway, let's let's not bash it to death. No. We'll see what happens later on this week, I guess. Uh, yeah. Portia, Absolutely. what is your love and hate? 
All right. Um, my, I've got it. It's, it's all one. Okay. I'm just going to combine my love and hate into one because it's a love hate. What I love and what I hate is that um, we had the podcast that last one I was on a few weeks ago after we just had a bad loss, I think, to Melbourne. And I was saying, oh, we're fine. If we win half of our remaining matches, we're still in line for top four and all we've got to do is beat Fremantle. And I oh, was thinking, oh, this is going well. I predicted all well, this is going well and everyone's having the little, you know, shit fits or whatever else. Um, when we're having those couple of losses and we just came that close, that close to finishing in fourth. And it took us letting through nine goals in a row to not finish fourth. And I just sort of... I'm really kind of annoyed. I'm really glad that we came that close to being top four because it shows that we definitely could have done it. And I think that it's also made a lot of people that were just getting really overwhelmingly negative for no good reason. It's given them... I would have thought if we won, we would have got that little bit of, okay, shut up, get on with it. We are in the finals. We're fine. But unfortunately, that loss, just the way we did it, this is the part I hate is we were so close and now we've given sort of justification for every bit of, oh, you know, blah, blah, but we need tools, we need to rebuild the side completely and all that sort of thing. Um, and I just know we've just opened the door to a whole bunch of total bullshit, really. <laughs> so that's my love hate. I love that we got this close. I love that we're in the finals, but I absolutely hate that we came that close and we didn't quite get there and now we've just got a whole bunch of, excuses for really quite pointless negativity. Mm. Mm. Well, the story of our season, or particularly the second half of the season, is sort of close but not close enough. Yeah, yeah. And not for good reasons either, I suppose. That's the other thing. No. But just as a secondary hate, I really hate that Cameron O'Shea got dropped. (laughs) Me too. Me too. Uh, Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. Poor Cam. Poor Cam. That's it. Okay. He'll be all right at St Kilda next year. Aye, aye, aye. None of this. Everything will be better. None of this. He'll be getting games every week at St Kilda. Intercept marking left, right and centre and running off his man and just showing us what could have been. Yeah, if only we traded Pittard instead. Hey, hey. Oh, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah. he, quite, he didn't quite, have, the best, quite, he didn't have the best game on the weekend, but we're all... all uh, Allowed to have a bad game every Rick, now and then. Rick, it was appalling, you know, and it's a finals game, so when you have that bad game, it's worth about four bad games, I would have thought. But he wasn't a lone soldier. No, oh, well. There, no, were, there were a few along with him. Yeah, true. But, but let's, not, let's not uh, steal Macca's love and hate. Oh, no, sorry. that's it. My love is... Uh, it's got to be Schultze finishing the year on a high with a big game... Um, in a, a finals type game to end the minor round, kick 62 goals for the year. You know, hadn't really been amongst the goals for a while now, so it was great to see him kick a bag before the finals to hopefully keep his confidence up and, and hopefully we see another big bag of goals from him this week as well. And my hate is uh, our preview podcast uh, for the Frio game, Rick. I think we jinxed it. Why is that, mate? I think we threw ourselves under the bus. Well, in what way? Well, I we, picked, I picked Frio team. by 37 points. I think they break out to yeah. a 37 points uh, point yeah. lead there for a while. Um, yeah. And we spoke at length about how fantastic it was that we hadn't really given up a lot of those sort of multiple goal runs throughout the season. <laughs> and then here we go, <laughs> and they kicked nine goals was... in a row. We jinxed it. <laughs> um, I feel terrible. And also our structures were that fantastic. They're horrible. Which, uh, yeah, the so. defence that we've been talking up all year was an absolute disaster. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, look, in in that respect, I sort of feel like the the huge win the week before was a bit like um, oh, what was it? Yeah, two thousand and seven when we had that absolute smashing of North Melbourne, and you're thinking, ah, oh, this is great, and then you just go in and get you know pants the next week because you just get so high on the hundred point win. Maybe your standards lower. Maybe you do a bit of half ass bullshit and get caught out. I don't know. Maybe it just gave us the wrong mindset going into a really tough game. Mm. Oh, look, I, th- I mean, is this just leading, segueing straight into the uh, the review, is it? Pretty well. Yep, we can do uh, that if you like. we got the power to win, power to roll. We, we were a little bit un- unlucky as well, where... I don't know if it was nerves with players not really thinking about the ball or watching the ball, but we didn't get the ball bounce our way the whole bloody game. 
at no, the amount of times our players ran at the ball and the ball bounced at 90 degrees, so it just sort of bounced into a Freo player's position more than a Port player position. It was just amazing. It was just it was very frustrating. How and then it brought me back the memories of Gavin Wanganeen, who I still think is the best player of being able to read what a ball's going to do in the air when it hits the ground. He he had that amazing ability to know where to be on the bounce of the ball. Because I think I even texted Macca during the game going, my God, these boys just aren't reading the ball bounce at all. And it was just really weird how the ball was bouncing on the free oval. So, I mean, that that's probably one of our minor issues um, compared to what the real issues were. But that was one of the major frustrations that I took out. Uh, <laughs> I'd, that. I'd suggest the part of that problem was basically that uh, – when you're waiting for the ball to bounce, it's always going to be a little bit of a lottery and uh, really you should just be doing whatever you can to make sure you actually get the ball rather than hoping it's going to bounce your way. I think that's probably what it shows is that we were not linking up correctly and that maybe we weren't uh, chasing the actual ball hard enough when it counted. Yeah, I do agree with that. Of course, the game we're talking about is round 23. It was Port versus Freo at Subiaco Oval. We ended up losing by eight points. We lost 14 goals, 13 to 16 goals, nine. Uh, Schultze had a, a big day out with six goals. Robbie Gray, Hamish Hartlett and Chad Wingard kicked two goals each. Um, I wouldn't mind sort of splitting this up into the two halves because they were both fairly different, um, sort of how the game was heading at half time to, to the final result. Um, what were your feelings at half time, people? Optimism. Oh, what a scoreline. It was fantastic. We were taking Frio head on. And we were performing very well. And really, let's face the facts, we should have been uh, much further in front at half time. We really squandered some perfect opportunities to get some more shots on goal. It was. That was probably, for me, I reckon, just about the most enjoyable half of football I've seen all year. I mean, it oh, was really? just... I loved it. it. I mean, the skills weren't fantastic, but it was absolute 100% balls to the wall, you know... Just crash bash football. It was absolute finals football at its best, I thought. I mean, I agree. It was pretty high standard of football, but uh, I don't know. Um, some games you sort of watch it and you feel, oh, yeah, I'm pretty confident in this. But other times you just watch a game and you can see these little things that you know you should be doing, like actually shepherding for the play over the ball rather than always just hoping that they're going to hand pass it to you down the line or something like that. And I just felt like we were not switching it up enough. We were not changing how we played enough. And I felt that going into half time, I felt that the way we were playing was really pretty predictable. And I think that sort of unfortunately came a bit true. Um mm when they had the half time to sort of reset and work out what we were doing, because we didn't change how we played in the second half, and I think that was what really um, caught us out. Not that we suddenly played worse, but that we didn't adapt to changing conditions and uh, changing defensive tactics against us. Yeah. Well, I think Ross Lyon won the coach's battle, obviously. Um, oh, he did. He did on the scoreboard. But, I mean, he, uh, he was able to manipulate his forward line yep. to have continual mismatches against our defenders, um, which was quite frustrating to me. And I don't, it's hard obviously not being at the game and watching it on TV. And I'd, hopefully we'll have Tim Dinover on this week, Macca, as well. So I'd love to hear his thoughts as, from, a, you know, from an expert opinion. But to me, it seemed like the, our tall defenders really pushed hard following their, their key forwards up outside the inside 50, which then allowed um, that forward space for the forwards then to run back into. Um, and our four, our defend, key defenders weren't there because it was actually quite annoying the amount of um, uh, forward entries Frio had where our key defenders actually weren't anywhere in sight. Is that something that uh, you two picked up? Uh, yeah. Um, I know that was basically an kick game and that we were all just chasing the ball, but I think that you, you're quite right in that they managed it better, and I think it actually at the other end of the ground it was managed better as well. Um, as the game went on, you saw more often that Freo players weren't getting wrong-footed when we were on the attack where they had done earlier because they worked out how we're going to play the ball, better awareness of what's going on. And uh, so when we tried to lure them out into an awkward position, they didn't go for it. They knew uh, what the preferred option was every time. So I think that they just they learnt during the game, and that was probably just the case with the forwards as well. Mm. I thought it was interesting, sort of the backline battle. I mean, in the first half, their tall forwards really dominated the play. I mean, Pavlich was in great form. Matthew Taberner kicked a couple of goals and was really sort of giving Homsch a bit of a runaround. 
And then it just completely changed after half time. Their tolls only kicked two behinds after half time, and that was both from Sanderlands in the ruck. Um, mm-hmm. And their smalls just absolutely tore us to pieces. Yep. Yep. And I wouldn't actually blame uh, Jarman and Impey as, as much as what supporters are, because there was a lot of occasions where um, there wasn't much really he could do to deny Ballantyne getting the ball, really. Um, no. you know, when Ballantyne's, you know, almost one out in the forward line, um, you know, with space, it's yeah. it's going to be a difficult ask for any defender, let alone a first year player. Um, and we weren't able to uh, congest the midfield, and we did allow them to, you know, that slingshot that we're known for. Frio were fantastic at creating that slingshot, and they had forty one inside fifties and twenty five scoring shots. Yep. I mean, that's fantastic conversion for their inside 50s. Yeah, their efficiency was a lot better than ours. I mean, it was just the same story with us where we were kicking it forward, but it was just coming straight back out again. Yep. Um, it was fairly similar to how it played out at Adelaide Oval earlier in the season where they had a couple of players drop back and they were just able to create that sort of run and rebound from defence. Mm. And the, Yeah, and I guess it's sort of what I was saying. We overcommitted to the forward motion at a time when we were not getting a consistency of delivery and secure uh, possession in the forward line. Mm. I mean, some of the interesting things that I took out of it, though, um, we had we, we generated 55 inside 50, so we gener- generated enough inside 50s to, to win the game. We actually uh, outmarked Frio inside 50, 17 to 14. Um, our stoppages, 33 to 22. And our clearance is 45 to 37. So our numbers were were fairly strong. Our tackles 69 to 58. So we are even out tackled Frio. So our key our key KPI indicators were I oh, don't really need to say indicators, do I? We're, we're quite strong <laughs> in the game, but we just couldn't. Um, it's like that ATM machine. Yeah. Uh, we just couldn't really <laughs> deliver on the scoreboard. And I guess that brings up a controversial point from mine. There was two things that again I guess agitated me is. One, Westhoff's not the best set shot on goal and he had a perfect opportunity to try and take a shot after the sire and for a bit of practice, still under a bit of pressure and instead just didn't give a shit and just kicked it haphazardly through for a point. Yeah. Um, and he really should have been practising maybe having a shot for goal under pressure. And secondly, very controversial, but our best player, maybe now one of the favourites for the Brownlow and also the winner of the coaches award has a major issue with kicking shots at goal. Yeah. He's always been a poor shot at goal. Robbie Gray in terms of set shots. I thought, um, I thought there was some improvement there in the last quarter where he kicked a couple of crucial goals, um, from set shots. But yeah, I mean, you just can't blow those chances. And it's been the real story of our season this year where we just can't kick straight when we need to kick straight. We can't kick those crucial goals, which will see us get a bit of a jump on the opposition and really put some pressure on. Um, and we just blow the chances when we've got the momentum. And uh, that's, but... the, that's the issue with, uh, with the opposition as well. Um, and it, I know you just quoted the clearance rate where we won at 45-37, but once again, we got absolutely smashed in the centre clearances where it's one-on-one where we seem to struggle and we need to throw extra players around the bowl, around the ground to actually win the footy um, at the stoppages. Well, I mean, you could see in the ruck that all day Matt Lobby was just basically chasing Sandilands and just trying to stuff up what he was doing rather than actually get any decisive control of the ball. Um, yep. I think that was just that was plainly obvious at every single tap. So um, that's always going to limit your ability to really clear. Um, for, as for Robbie Gray's shots at goal, um, I agree that was a huge problem when he was a small forward. But honestly, if someone gets the midfield possession that he does and they occasionally kick points, I mean, that, that's, that's fine. I expect that from a midfielder that... Maybe they're going to spend their whole game gut running, and then when they go for the shot at goal, they're not necessarily going to be as good as a specialist forward because this is what Robbie's being. He's not being a specialist forward now. He's being a midfielder, and I think that we need to accept that he needs to be judged by that criterion rather than, you know, oh, he's played forward for years. He should be able to kick those ones. I don't think that's a reasonable expectation because the fitness base is different. Um, he would he would be absolutely exhausted compared to what he would have been as a small forward in the past. I would think. Yep. You're um, just trying to be. Goal. Different and controversial now, Porsche. But I'm pretty sure that one that he hit off the kicked the wrong side of the ball was from a forward stoppage. So he probably would have had a bit of a breather, and 
it yeah, I do. I do. It. Down. it takes a while well for a heart rate to go down, Rick. Not everybody, <laughs> Portia. Some people just pretty cold, <laughs> flatline the whole way through. But Not- uh, oh, I'm a hard. They, honestly, they were two sitters. Really, let's. I understand, what, and I agree with what you're saying. But those two shots of goal that he missed, um, and I, I don't like to compare uh, apples with oranges. But I mean, if he's going to be compared to um, very similar to Gary Ablett, there's no way Gary Ablett would have missed either of those shots on goal. Um, and most of the upper echelon players, I don't think, would have missed those sort of goals. And look, I'm not trying to be so controversial. Do you want to have a go at Robbie Gray because he's not Gary Ablett? Is that what you're saying, Rick? Cause I no, I'm having a go at Robbie Rick. Gray because he, he, kicked, he missed two sitters that he should have kicked and we lost by eight points. And to be looked upon as one of the best players in the league now, yeah. from my opinion... Uh, if if you're one of the best players in the league, you would uh, you'd deliver those in those big moments 99% of the time for those standard Jesus shots and goals. Really, how many times have we seen the best players in the league kick points from things that should have been goals? Pavlich, just on the topic of best players in the game, how many times have we seen Pavlich choke in an important game for Fremantle and kick points instead of goals? And he's considered one of the best key position players of his time. That's an yeah, absolutely but we're not, that's, regular that's thing not, that happens. He's not a key position player. He's a uh, he's a key key midfielder, small small forward, and uh, he should be doing better than that. Honestly, I, I think. I mean, you're like, absolutely right because that's why the common medals Ablett. full of small forwards every year and not big tall guys. Gary Ablett, Scott Pendlebury, <laughs> Dane Swan, um, all fantastic players. Even Walters, small forward. Um, those guys don't miss those those easy shots. I'm not talking about a check side in the pocket from 45 metres out. I'm no, talking not. about a shot on goal from, from a 45-degree angle and running into an open goal from dead in front 20 metres out. Um, really, they're laydowns, in my opinion. I've seen what, – what about? I still remember, and I remember because of Michael Wilson's reaction, I still remember Corey McKernan running yes. into an open goal. At the top of the goal square, he kicked a point, and he almost won a Brownlee medal if he hadn't been suspended. So I don't think you got the right point there, Rick. No, well, I, I just think it's part of part of the game, though, where momentum is lost, and uh, and then the opposition can gain control, and and then they they create turning points in the game, though. So and he's not completely at fault. So I'm not I'm not by any means yeah. saying he is the be all and end all. All I'm saying is I guess I've got high expectations for Robbie and I do think he's one of the best players in the competition at the moment. I just think in those big moments, generally, the best players in the competition deliver and I think he can be questionable with the, just that aspect of the game. But I think the other other thing that's worth talking about is the um, uh, the courage of uh, Ollie Wines. I thought he was uh, magnificent with some of the courageous things and putting his body on the line on the weekend for... Uh, a young player was just fantastic. Yeah, he had a good game, and of course he copped that massive hit from uh, Paul Duffield, where he went back and uh, knew that a hit was coming, and he copped a big knee into the back. Um, but you know, he got up and played the uh, played it out, and had a very good game. I thought it was probably his best game for a you know a good sort of four or five weeks. Yeah, look, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I think that. Holly Wines is just a player that we're just going to keep seeing slowly develop until he's something pretty amazing. Um, you certainly have a very good year for what a second year player. Excellent. Um, yeah, I hope he can keep improving. Well, he didn't even think twice about backing into that pack. No, it was just no. no it was, and he was going to do it again until he was called out of it later in the game. Yeah, and I'm yeah. glad he was called out of it. Look, I think that with Ollie, um, that's something that. It's great. He can lock that in that he's a courageous player. Um, the difficult thing for him now is just going to be improving, I suppose, the uh, importance of his disposal um, as opposed to just, you know, the frequency and um, being part mm. of it, doing the tough things. It's going to be actually making it have a real impact because um, I think that sometimes, you know, his possession, it, it's good and he does the tough stuff, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he's just not getting to the right spots yet. We'll see. So, look, where did it all go wrong? You know, we got two goals up. Um, six minutes into the third quarter, uh, and then we just stopped. Well, you said we got smashed in the centre clearances there for a while, didn't we? We we really struggled to um, negate Sanderland's influence there also, and we just didn't really get our, our hand on the pill, and we didn't deliver into our uh, forward line, even though it's uh, it's been a lot better than uh, recent times. 
uh, we still delivered a little haphazardly um, to outnumbered um, areas of our inside 50, which then, then allowed, played into Frio's hands and allowed them to rebound into open space and we, we couldn't negate it, where, where, whereas we were negating it in the first half quite well. Um, well, I mean, you've already said it earlier, I think, Macca, is that the goal output for Freeman will change completely in the two halves and I think that all that really happened is we just didn't adapt fast enough when the changes came. Yeah, you mm. could see them clear out their forward 50 and they were sort of running with the flight of the ball and creating a lot of space for their quick guys to run into. But, you know, we just really lack that midfield pressure as well. You know, they, they had a lot of goals where it was kind of, you know, like the slingshot, I guess, you know, from end to end. They kicked a lot of goals like that. Mm, mm. You know, yeah. Don't. And should we, should our defence maybe maybe hung back? I think one of, was it... Um, was it Brereton in the commentary was saying we or Rashudo we need that anchor, we we needed that that spare player playing a little bit deeper to try and stop them just running into an open goal and I mean I thought that was a pretty fair call call actually we we just didn't have that one there. Look, I think that's a fair call, but I think also that one of the things that Fremantle's known for is that if you are not able to rack up rack it up in the scoreboard, they're going to win, um, and so I think that. It, yeah, obviously, as far as limiting their scoring ability, it's good to have that extra extra defenders back. But I think that obviously, it was, I think it was obviously a, a deliberate ploy by us to not do that, so that we could just be more continuously on the offensive. And look, you know, I mean, we kicked nearly 100 points against Fremantle. How many sides have done that this year? Yeah. Um, it just didn't work out for us quite the way we wanted, uh, just for that period in the third quarter where it all went horribly wrong. Mm. Well, I, I I actually texted um, to Maka during the game, Porsche. Where, like where was Trengo like the whole the whole time? I I hardly ever saw him at a contest, and I'm not having like I'm not saying that you know he was running away or anything, but Frio seemed to be pretty clever. I I thought with taking Jackson out of the play quite consistently because he didn't seem to have any influence in any uh, massive contested situation for the game or for the bulk of it anyway. You spot on there. I think. Um... You know, they were using Zach Clark as the decoy and, and yeah. sort of playing him on the opposite side of the ground where the ball was generally coming in from. So, yeah, they did a fantastic job of, of stopping Trengo from getting into sort of damaging positions in the back line. But I was actually surprised how little Trengo was in the ruck as well. I, I agree on the ruck one. But um, as far as Trengo having not a lot of impact in defence, you, you're quite right, he was um, led away. But also... I think we've still got to remember he's coming back from injury and Fremantle, if they clear out and leave a lot of space in their forward line, it's a lot of ground to cover. Um, I don't know, I think maybe we just were hoping he could recover faster and better than he has. Um, yeah. I well, he, he was, was fine good. the week before. I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, but it's... Carlton was sort of a training drill, but... Yeah. Yeah, he just... Yeah, it just seemed... It just seemed strange. He just seemed to be sucked away from the ball, which is smart by Frio and... And I guess if that's the case, some bad coaching. And they're the sort of things you can't really pick up on TV that you can live at the game. So True. it'll be interesting, hopefully, watching it live this week to, to see what happens. Do you think we made a bit of a selection error in dropping Cam O'Shea? Absolutely. <laughs> Who would you have kept in the uh, sorry dropped out instead of him? Uh, look, I know everyone's scapegoating more. I don't know. Uh, if I could do it with the full benefit of hindsight, probably Jared Pollack, because I didn't think he offered us much on the weekend. Um, I think that I think having the multiple options for rebound rather than just relying purely pretty much on um, Jasper Pittard, I think that would have been a really good thing for us with O'Shea. And I think that his reading of the play and his fitness, these are the two things that really would have helped O'Shea out um, at Subiaco because there's a lot of ground to cover and the ball was not coming in a lot of the time the ball was not coming in as pinpoint accuracy. So someone there that can run all day and can read the play really well, I mean, I would have thought it would be pretty much an ideal game for Cameron. But, but yes, I must admit, I will agree. My, my boy Bat, Jasper did have a pretty average game. Oh, um, I'll, uh, I'll cop that one on the chin and uh, I won't hide away from it. And, but I, I didn't think he was alone. I, I thought Homps really got exposed in the first half, but he did fight back well in the second half. Um, but again, that came back to our, our structure in defence with our key defenders really seemed to be out of alignment and Frio were doing a fantastic job in uh, in getting rid of our players or, or their, out their forwards losing our defenders um, and getting it to easier contests, which was uh, quite frustrating. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, we 
look, we can't ask for much more. Playing away in Perth uh, to lose by eight points. You know, Hawthorne, who's still a premiership contender, went over there and lost by six goals. So, you know, we didn't do too badly. And again, I guess we just left our run uh, a little bit late, which was a, a bit frustrating. But the one advantage is if we, if if and when we do beat Richmond this week, um, I guess this will be a good uh, practice run for, for, for next week. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, I would certainly hope that we can beat Richmond this week. Um, I guess the real question is, and I know that something has already come up, but I don't want to spoil your preview too much for later in the week, but I guess do we bring in another tour for this week just to start seeing if they, they can be an option for us? Well, Jackson didn't write off the possibility of Butcher maybe coming back for finals, did he, Macca? I don't know. It's probably too far gone now. Mm. Yeah. Do, I mean, if you do, if you were going to do it, you would have done it sort of two or three weeks ago to make sure that it was ready to go come finals time. Uh, I mean, to bring in a third toll now when you haven't done it since round three, I don't know. It's I, Unless I, they've I, been practicing it at training every week for the last sort of two months, I'm not sure it's going to work. Well, I, th- I think the only reason I'd say something like that is that we have been reasonably consistently worked out on our game plan recently and adding something new that we have actually trained a bit to do and have done in the past could actually be a bit of a, a wild card. Um, you know, sometimes the, the player is a wild card and sometimes just the setup is a wild card and I think that could be a good one for us to sort of get over Richmond and uh, catch them off guard a little bit, hopefully. Yeah, that's a fair call. Mm. Mm. Well, look, who were your best players on the weekend? You first, pick. Really, I had uh, I had Hamish Hartlett up there. I thought he he played another very good, strong, solid game. A um, couple of goals, uh, very influential for me, and he's really just racking it up week after week. Macca, um, Robbie Gray, um, again outside of his goal kicking, which I was a bit critical of, uh, was very influential. Um, Jay Schultz with his six goals, and they were a lot of them were leading to the goals, which makes me very happy. And great marks at the same time. So uh, I thought Jay uh, had a fantastic game, and really probably could have him second. Travis Boak uh, fought hard, another great battle with uh, with Crowley, and uh, I would have loved to have got Chatty in there, but he just sort of uh, he just sort of uh, dropped off at the end. So I'll give it to uh, Ollie Wines instead, and. Probably uh, a couple of possessions for the second half just wasn't enough for, for Chad for the overall game. Yeah, I agree with most of that. Yep. <laughs> oh, that was easy. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm just kind of dumbfounded because it's not often I agree with you, Rick. So, yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. That's what she says. Done. Okay. So, mine, uh, Robbie Gray, definitely best on ground, even with the set shots. I, I, yeah, I mean, it's a bad thing, but I, of all the things that you can complain about in this match, I think having a go at probably the best guy on ground is a bit rough. Um, Jay Schultz, absolutely, I thought he was pretty good. Um, I am going to give Chad Wingard votes because I think that uh, in games like this, the important things are the people that uh, impact on the momentum of the game, not just people that rack up stats. And I think that as far as uh, having a real game-changing input and really keeping us in it at a time that I was sort of thinking, yeah, I don't know if we're doing all that great. Um, Chad Wingard was fantastic. And uh, I, like I said in the, the game day thread, I really feel like he hates Freo as much as I do. He just um, really came up with some really good really good plays, I thought. Um, apart from that, gosh, I don't know. Hartlett was okay. Um I thought Carlisle was okay in the first half. Um, that's about all I've got. I thought I thought Carlisle had a bit of a shocker, to be honest. Uh, I, I thought he got uh, rings rung around him for a lot of the game. I know Macca didn't see it like that. I know because I, uh, I was having a bit of a go and Macca was sticking up for him. But I don't know, maybe it was just the whole structure thing which was out of whack and so... Carlisle was being made to look to be worse than what he actually was. Look, our defence in the first half was a bit of a shambles and, and definitely Homsch probably played his worst half for, you know, possibly all year and, you know, maybe Carlisle as well. I thought he had a rotten first half, but they both um, really came together in that second half and, and shut out their 
direct opponents and and as I said earlier, it was kind of the smalls that did all the damage and, and our small defenders that dropped the ball after half time. Do you think mm. part of the problem, because we're having a, a an issue, well, not an issue, but the key defenders as a whole were sort of thinking, yeah, they could have done better. Do you think part of the issue is that we don't have, with Homs, Carlisle and Trengove, we don't have what we traditionally have had with the Port Adelaide defence is one key position backman that has a lot of pace. Um, you know, Trengove's OK, Carlisle's not great and honestly Homsch isn't all that great either. We used to have guys like Bishop going just running, running behind the bloke even if he was not a fantastic contester he was always at least present um, when the ball was being sent into the forward line do you think that's something that caught us out in the very much a running ground at Subiaco? Is that maybe where O'Shea comes into it? Yeah, absolutely I mean it's a third option, why not? Yeah. Oh look, I thought you know, I think O'Shea would have had a fantastic game on the weekend and possibly if he was out there, as a number of people have said on the on the uh, on the forum this week, um, if he was out there, the result may have even been different. Because I think that game would have suited his style of play, yep. um, absolutely down to a tee. Hmm. I guess we were probably worried about Walters and um, and uh, Ballantyne and maybe O'Shea getting exposed. Well, we just lacked options in the end on who to yeah. go to them. I mean, yeah. you know, Jonas was getting the run around from Walters. You know, Impey, you know, struggled after half time on Ballantyne. We just lacked that other option to be able to throw to those players. Yeah, there's not a lot of diversity in our defence. I don't feel, um, you know, the, the backmen apart from Trengo, like Carlo and Homsch, not too different. Carlo and even Trengo is not enormously different again, which means it's great if we want three of the same thing. But if we want to have unique matches for unique players, it's a little bit harder for us to do. Um, whereas if, you know, you go back to our 2004, we had, uh, even with the back plane, because we had a lot of variety in what they could do. In Wilson, with Hardwick, that, Wayne Ganeen, you know, we had real diversity back there, and I feel like just at the moment it's all a bit vanilla. Would Logan have made a difference on the on the small forwards? Not really. Oh, maybe, right. but, yeah, you never maybe. know. And what about the calls for um, Jakey Need to be dropped after his one average game? bit harsh? Uh, well, it might be harsh, but it's also possibly fair. I mean, there's probably a number of, of players out there whose spot might come into question. I mean, we're talking about Jakey Need. Jarman Impey might find himself out of the out of the side again. Monfries might get dropped. Matty White, you know, how's his groin looking? I mean, there's an, a number of players that could find themselves out of the side this week. And also just on that, I and mean, it's not a, not a Port Adelaide only thing, this is a league-wide thing, but if you're a small player... Um, again, this is going to sound like I'm being anti-small players, but I'm not. Um, if you're a small player, there's usually a higher expectation that you need to perform at your best to be competing because if you're not, there's too many disadvantages against you. And I think every, even the best ones, even the best small players, have been dropped reasonably regularly if they're not performing. Um, I'd say even someone like Bernard Harvey spent time not playing in the top team when he's been out of form. Uh, certainly guys like Stephen Milne and God knows who else, Ballantyne, you know, everyone spends time. When if you're a smaller player, you definitely spend time. If you're not in form, um, you don't you know, play on the top side. And I think that's just what really was um, need was being held accountable for. Because if you if you don't have those extra physical advantages, you've got to be completely on your game every game. Yeah. Look, it might sound a bit harsh because Needy's last sort of two or three weeks before that were very very good. But oh, yeah. You know, this time of year, you just need everyone performing at their best. Yeah. Yeah. But then again, I mean, the other still, question is, who do you bring in? If yeah, you so drop need, exactly, I mean, who do you yeah. bring in? I mean, people's favourite Kane Mitchell or people's favourite Sam Gray. I mean, they're probably the, the next in line. Yeah, and so um, I just keep need him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Benny Newton. Benny Newton. Too slow. <laughs> yeah, there's not a spot in the side for Andrew Moore and Ben Newton, I don't think. Oh, God, no. Uh, Andrew is a bit slow, isn't he? He's a bit of a, uh, bit of a uh, Titanic out on the uh, on the footy field. I thought Andrew Moore had a, a pretty good second half, but geez, in that first half he just looked too timid. I don't know if it's his shoulder, if he's still having issues with his shoulder, or whether the fact that he's done his shoulder twice this year, or three times this year has um, has blown his confidence in, in attacking the ball as hard as he was last year. But I think it's a marked difference in the way that he is attacking the ball, and it's just coming across as too timid. It felt like in the first half that Freo were trying to play through him, actually. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Well, look, uh, my best players. Uh, my best on ground was Robbie Gray. I thought he had a fantastic game once again. 
Um, could that have sealed his Brownlow? You never know. I'd expect he'd be a, a big possibility to get the three votes, even though we lost. Um, he was fantastic. I had uh, Schultz here second best on ground. Six goals um, against such a dour defense like Frio's was a fantastic effort. Um, Hamish Hartlett up there again, just super consistent these days. 24 touches, two goals. Fantastic effort. Uh, Justin Westhoff, I thought that was his best game for a while, even with his farcical um, effort uh, in that third quarter where he just seemed to get lost on what to do with the ball. Um, you know, he was marking everything and, and gave a really good contest. And I thought uh, Kane Corns who we haven't really spoken about at all this podcast, did a fantastic job on uh, Stephen Hill. And, you know, he I thought Hill tore Corns a new one in the first half um, in the earlier game this year, but he really shut him out um, considerably well on the weekend. So, shall we... Uh... Trent Ray from 45 metres out against the break. 